Welcome everybody. This is a very special day. Um, first of all, because we have a, an amazing speaker from the inner circle of artificial intelligence, but also it's a big day in the US, as most of you will know. Um, and like in any uh, Zoom salon, we organized uh, there's three parts. The first bit will be um, Richard Boyd, the CEO of Tanyo, an amazing specialist on artificial intelligence, sharing how he got into this business and why it's so important to him. Then he will set out the artificial intelligence agenda for the future of work. And in the end, the last 20 minutes or so, uh, we will have uh, the opportunity to do a great Q&A with Richard. If you have any questions for Richard, just please put them in the Q&A or in the chat so I will monitor them. And then after Richard did his presentation, uh, we'll uh, do them in the Q&A. And, and I will invite you to ask a question yourself. And if you don't want that, then I will do it for you. So without further ado, I stop sharing here and I will give the full floor to Richard. Richard, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Guido. Uh, appreciate the invitation here. I know, of course, all of you have uh, other items competing for your entertainment attention today. Guido and I were just talking about that. And I've just returned from DC where I was kicking off uh, one of the largest AI contracts in uh, US government history for the GSA. Uh, oh, and I just saw Mark Prinsky is attending. Mark, I'm a huge fan. Um, I've quoted your work quite a, quite a lot in my career. So uh, I'm, I, I'm humbled and, and very much appreciate your spending your attention here. Because I know Herbert Simon said, attention is one of the most valuable resources of the century. So again, thanks very much. Um, Guido and I met when I did a talk recently to the, uh, uh, the PCI group uh, where I talked about what we're doing with personas and, and uh, harnessing data exhaust to create models of humans artificially and what we're doing with them for both good and, of course, not so good uh, in, in, in the industry, at least. I'm trying to do good. I'm doing my best. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little bit. And... Uh, but he did ask me to focus on this issue, which I think has been pretty well traveled, I think, over the last four or five years around what is the future of work in this age of automation and uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, and what I'm offering you today, of course, which I hope, again, is worthy of the attention you're spending with me today, is my perspective on that. And I hope it will be worth your time. And this is the entertainment portion of your day. <laughs> so uh, speaking of entertainment uh, and perspective, this is a slide I like to start with uh, that just sort of gives you what my perspective is. Uh, Alan Kay would say that perspective is worth ADIQ points. And I always hope that that's enough to help me, um, again, be worthy of your time. Uh, but this is my perspective, kind of my entire 30-year uh, career working in computer gaming, artificial intelligence, uh, AR, VR uh, for, the, uh, for the last 30 years. I'm not going to go through all this, but um, if you played games in the 90s, uh, games that were built together with folks like Tom Clancy, uh, my colleagues and I created Red Storm Entertainment uh, that created the very first realistic tactical 3D shooter game. I'll talk about why that's important for artificial intelligence and simulation and the future of work. Uh, we did games with Michael Crichton, with uh, science fiction writer Douglas Adams, uh, with Ozzy Osbourne, which was a spectacular disaster we won't talk about today. Uh, and. You know, in the early uh, aughts, uh, after the turn of the century, uh, I decided to read work by people like Mark Prensky and others around, you know, what is the future of education and how do we take all these uh, technologies we've developed in computer gaming and AI and elsewhere. And the reason why I mention computer gaming a lot is, of course, because a mastery of AI has always been important for gaming. It was somewhat rudimentary maybe in the 90s, but today, you know, we're building very convincing worlds and populating them with increasingly convincing human beings, which we're just making artificially. Uh, uh, Non-player characters that have rich <clears throat> histories and lives that interact with us in increasingly convincing ways. And that's getting uh, interesting for all sorts of reasons. Uh, a lot of work in the movie industry as you see some of that. And then 
you know, Lockheed Martin, the big uh, 100-year-old aerospace company, bought my company in 2007. So I spent six years there. And you'll hear me reference that quite a lot in our time together today, uh, where I created a group called Virtual World Labs, because no one told me I couldn't, um, kind of modeled it after the Skunk Works, if you've heard about that, uh, that Lockheed had. We had our own logo, our own website, and we were working in this field of VR, AR, and AI. Uh, and of course, I learned that uh, you know, trying to adjust to this idea of like being in small computer game companies with people with tattoos and earrings and nose rings and everything to this uh, hundred year old aerospace company where we were making fighter jets and, and you know, uh, spacecraft, um, uh, you know, how, how, how to a adjust to that. But uh, I found that um, every time we did a patent disclosure, you get a check. So that turned into our incentive program. We did over a hundred patent disclosures in my little team uh, in the fields of AR, VR, and AI. So I'll talk about some of those discoveries which brought me in front of you here today and how I sort of got religion on all this stuff. So let's just set the stage for this conversation. There's, there's so many different ways of uh, framing it. This is one way I think of it. I, I like to play chess. Um, uh, and so I always think about things in, in terms of like the opening game, the middle game and the end game. And if you've ever played chess, you know that it's a fairly complex game for humans. Uh, you know, the middle game alone has as many potential positions as there are, uh, you know, probably, uh, I, I guess, stars in the galaxy, right? Um, and so complex uh, and, you know, sort of mapping this sort of progress that we're making with these tools that we've been building. And, and you'll see some arbitrary dates here, like 1968. Why is that an important date? Well, I just sort of mark that as that point where we saw the mother of all demos, right? Where um, uh, Alan Kay and, and Douglas Engelbart and his group there at Xerox PARC demonstrated things like object-oriented programming and the Windows interface and the mouse. Uh, um, so I think of modern computing as, of course, we've had computers for much longer than that, but this is the point at which we started really engaging with computers. Even before personal computers came along, we were, we were, they, they, they were really remapping how we engage with each other and with information and how we do work. Uh, so that's how I've, I've sort of started it. And then that, in that first stage, uh, we, you know, we're adapt, we're building technologies. And as Marshall McLuhan would say, the things we made made us in that you know, we're, we're adapting to like, we gotta learn how to type. Um, we're getting carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, we're learning batch commands and things like that and working with the machines on their terms. This middle game that we're in right now, I find really interesting and I'll tell you why I say it started in 2009. Um, but now we're, we're going mobile. You know, the interface is becoming more ambient. We have things like Siri and Alexa and uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and I always, I usually tell a little story about how uh, my daughter around that time was a, just a couple of years old. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I walked in um, to the uh, uh, living room and she was on my flat screen TV, swiping her hand across the TV. And of course, by that time, she already had like iPad and, and some of those other devices or just gotten an iPad or at least had touch screens. I can't remember what we had at that time. Um, and, and I came in and I said, what are you trying to do? Stop touching this uh, rapidly depreciating device that I put in our living room. And she's like, oh, you know, daddy, I want to change the channel. And I'm like, no, honey, here's what you do. Here's these three different um, uh, remote controls that control like here's for the speakers and the, and, the, and the sound system. This is for the TV. This is for the cable. And she just looked at me like I was insane. And I realized, of course, like, yeah, this is really stupid. Why doesn't it just do our will? Why does it need me to push all these buttons in order to, to uh, do what I want it to do? It should just understand my intent. And so we're getting to that point where we don't even have to push the buttons anymore, right? Uh, or even essentially maybe even not have to speak uh, to these devices in, that, in order to have them uh, 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 perform what we want them to do. So this is what's getting really interesting, but it's also really scary. So there's positives and negatives. There's like all technologies, you know, it has a double-edged sword uh, element to it. And then of course, we can't have this conversation without this last stage, the end game. Where are we going to end up? Um, are we going to achieve what Hans Moravec says is our, ourselves in more potent form? 
um, where ubiquitous AI surrounds us, but it's serving us instead of us serving it? Um, or are we gonna, uh, or, and as we get towards the singularity, which I'm just gonna go ahead and click to, and of course there's the negative elements of the singularity we're gonna talk about, right? But this idea of the technological singularity, and I, I wanna assume everybody knows about it, but just in case you don't, and Guido told me not to assume. Uh, so it's this idea that there's some point at which these things we've made, not only are they remaking us, but they've exceeded our, you know, there's a point at which machine intelligence exceeds human intelligence. And there are some who think that's the last invention we'll ever need to make, especially if it's adaptive and it can improve itself, what we call AI plus. And we'll talk about that in this, in this uh uh, talk uh, as well. But, you know, if you look at how Ray Kurzweil has been talking about it, and I've been going to singularity conferences for a while and, and uh, engaging with this, and I've, I've met with Werner Vinge, and I'm a big fan of his work. But if you look at this chart from one of the, I think it's from Singularity is Near, uh, from a long, from early 2000s, 2003, I think, uh, Ray says that 2023 is the year where $1,000 will buy you more intelligence or more computation than is available in the human brain. Now we can argue about how do you measure that, all that sort of thing, but that's awfully close, isn't it? Um, and, when, and that's with $1,000. Now, where are we with supercomputers and massively parallel computing systems, um, quantum computers? Some are arguing that we're already there, right? And uh, so we'll see, uh, see what happens. But if you hear a bump in the night, it may be that point at which we've passed the singularity and uh, everything changes after that. So here's one last way to frame it. And again, I'll say 2009 because that's the year when I kind of got uh, religion on machine learning. So I'll talk about that a bit. But I, I say that, you know, from 1958 to 2009, when AI really started, uh, came out of, you know, MIT in that area up there, uh, this idea that we can create, um, uh, sort of replicate human intelligence in machines that in this first phase of that from 1958 to 2009, um, if you wanted a computing device to do something, first a human had to understand it. And then a human sits down and writes the rigid instructions to tell the computer what to do. That's the first phase. And that's why it's so brittle and why sometimes we, we falter and it doesn't do what we expect it to, to do. It falls short of our expectations. Um, and, but I think that time changed, and, and for me it changed in 2009, when we finally realized that, you know, and I, and I was part of the early DARPA, or actually I attended, I shouldn't say part of, I attended some of the early DARPA attempts at creating autonomous vehicles. And those early attempts were horrible, you know, with uh, with uh, the, the vehicles sort of losing their way, losing their GPS coordinates, running into rocks. Um, and because we were still trying to say like, how does a human drive a car? Let me put that into a finite state machine or into some kind of rules-based engine or something and, and tell the computer how to drive a car. The problem with that is we don't fully understand how we drive a car. Um, and by the way, machines don't drive the car, don't drive cars the way humans do because they have different inputs and outputs. They have GPS input, they have, you know, they might have uh, LIDAR, uh, radar, sonar, who knows, right? Um, and different ways of controlling it. And um, when humans drive cars, it's mostly about ignoring most of the information around you, not computing everything at real time as you're going down the road at 70 miles an hour. Um, so we had to learn a different way of creating these kinds of systems. And that's the new way is of course, uh, machine learning where instead of writing algorithms, you actually have a massive set of examples. You feed it to a set of really good machine learning systems that can crunch all that stuff, learn it. And today uh, we can just feed a hundred hours of video to a autonomous vehicle system at Lockheed Martin and have it go out and perform flawlessly. Uh, we can have you know cars that drive flawlessly, uh, or I like to say everywhere except in Rome where it's impossible for anybody to navigate. Um, and then we're in this last phase, which I hope I'll have time to talk about. Guido just told me right before the call, I was like, make sure you talk about this, Richard. So I just added a bunch of slides very quickly to talk about how we actually um, make systems that can potentially pass the Turing test, can model human behavior from data exhaust that we're all leaving behind on the internet, 
And what does that mean, again, for both uh, good and for ill? So here's one point, just a marker point for me, and I don't know how many of you were paying attention to this. I'm taking you all the way back to 2007 here. This is a point at which in the financial trading industry, we started using what's called high frequency trading systems, algorithms. So instead of human traders out there making decisions and making transactions, we started creating automated, automated systems that would do this. Now you're looking at that activity. Now we're in 2008, you're seeing the number of trades across all of these indices you see on the right beginning to accelerate. Uh, and nobody was paying any attention because one of the issues with these technologies that are disrupting our lives is that policy, and I, like I said, I just come from DC, I was able to escape uh, late last night before all the uh, other festivities started. Uh, but, uh, you know, policy trails technology by at least 10 years. Um, and this was definitely true in the financial industry in that these certain traders were starting to create algorithms, put them on, putting them on really fast computers and outperforming humans right away. So you can see the volume of trades that are happening in 2009, et cetera. And nobody, nobody in the SEC was following this. They were uh, maybe starting to look at it about 2010. But in 2011, and this is when I was at Lockheed Martin, we caught trading systems trading with each other in the future. I'm just going to pause for a second, let you think about that. So around that time, when I learned about this, is the time that I called up my financial advisor and fired him. I said, you can't help me anymore. You know, what are you doing? Like, how can you help me when we've got systems uh, trading with each other at the speed of light? And it's not even enough for uh, you know, a firm to say, well, we have a really great computer and it's really fast and we have this special set of algorithms. Uh, your computer, you have to have all of that, but also your compute system and your, and your really masterful algorithms have to be as close as possible physically to where the other trading systems are because now the speed of light matters greatly. So you can't be in Yonkers. Or, or Chicago and trading with systems in New York. You've gotta be in the building next to the one in Wall Street that that's how you get an advantage. Um, and it took, you know, and, and I was talking about this in 2013 at this conference at Mod SimWorld where, where I was saying just what I'm telling you now that man, we humans now are creating systems so complex, we don't understand how they work, much less can we have any hope of being able to control them uh, uh, and master them or regulate them. So finally, you know, Michael Lewis wrote this book that came out, and this is the same guy who wrote um, uh, Money Game around baseball, but he wrote this thing about, around Flash Boys saying, hey, you know, we need to really start looking at this. And it wasn't until I think the next year that finally the SEC started regulating high frequency trading platforms and looking at it saying, hey, this isn't fair. Um, but that's what happens. We keep getting taken by surprise. And Guido and I were talking right before this talk about, you know, I've just come from DC um, launching that big contract where we were uh, talking about how fast things are moving and the Turing test and all these sorts of, uh, of items. And I said, you know, I like to think that I'm on sort of the inside circle of a lot of these conversations, talking with Alan Kay and and Joey Ito at the MIT Media Lab before, and, and folks, and Reed Hoffman, and folks like that, um, where we talk about this quite often, um, but we keep getting caught by surprise. So, uh, so it's kind of hard to make predictions. So I'll just talk again briefly about how I got religion on this. In 2009, I was at Lockheed Martin. They'd acquired the company. I was running Virtual World Labs. There was this guy named Alex Kitman, and there, there's Jaron Lanier also on my left shoulder. Uh, they were working on this project called Natal, which is the Microsoft Connect, right? Which is a system that needed to understand what a living room was and be able to track people. The, the human body becomes the controller. Um, I didn't really know what I was in for when they said, hey, come out here and let's see if Lockheed Martin has any tech that can help us. Um, I realized pretty quickly, by the way, that no, we can't help you. You guys are far ahead of us. You've got some really interesting stuff here in terms of like the imaging sensors that you have and the way you're calculating it. But that's when I learned that they had this cool little thing called machine learning. And I, of course, I, we already knew about machine learning. We were in the know on AI, felt like we're on the cutting edge, but I hadn't realized how far it had come. And it, even at that point, they're just trying to teach the system, you know, 
here's what a living room is. And here's the difference between a chair and a table and a lamp and a cat and a dog. And how can it recognize me versus my, you know, my brother or my sister um, and do all that in any lighting condition and condition or whatever. And again, they realize we can't do it the old way of let me just program the rules in. Let's give it every example of every living room across the world. What's the difference between an Asian living room or an American living room or a rural versus urban? And it took 24,000 hours of CPU pro, uh, sort of crunching just to be able to teach it what that, uh, how to do those things. But of course, today with GPUs, we're way past that. And now we can do things in a matter of hours or days as opposed to 24,000 hours. Um, but that's when I realized that everything's different. Like, forget algorithms. Let's just have large data sets of examples, good machine learning systems, and we can do some amazing things. And uh, that, that's what really changed my view of uh, where we were uh, and caused me very shortly after that to leave Lockheed Martin to really get into this field a lot more quickly where I can apply it in a lot of different ways. Um, and just a couple other markers that I know many of you already are tracking, um, but just in case some of you haven't, you know, that's the other thing that happened around that time. I think this was 2012 or so uh, is uh, DeepMind started saying like, you know, how can we apply machine learning to exceed human uh, capability in different areas? And let's look at games. So they took like 57 Atari games and that's me with Nolan Bushnell, the guy who founded Atari. He also founded Chuck E. Cheese because he needed a place to put his, you know, his game consoles. Uh, but I've, I've collaborated with him on a couple of different projects, mostly in education, and we continue to talk. But this thing now of, of building a machine learning system that can just, again, you don't program it, you just let it watch humans play games, feed it a lot of examples, and it can infer its own understanding, adapt itself with reinforcement learning, and very quickly learn to exceed the ability of humans to perform these tasks. And now, of course, and this is a recent thing, because uh, they did it with breakout and a couple of things, but now the, the algorithm called, or the machine learning library set called Agent 57 outperforms all humans on all Atari games. So again, things are accelerating pretty quickly. And this is just one of those things we should take note of and say, wow, it's happening fast. Um, and then again, in 2016, that's when you know, again, those of us who are in the know, and I was already out of Lockheed at that time, um, working in this field of machine learning, building stuff, trying to go to conferences and stay on top of it. But we were all still saying that, you know, it's one thing for a machine to beat a human at chess. Chess is complex, but it's still somewhat bounded, even though there's as many moves as there are stars in our galaxy. Um, but we're a decade away from, if you, if I, if I was talking at a conference in that, at that time, I would say, you know, we're a decade away from, being able to uh, win at a game like Go that has, you know, deception and uh, intuition and that some of the things we still thought of as purely human capabilities. Uh, and that was the year, of course, when AlphaGo beat Lee Settle, uh, the, the master, the number one master in the world at the game of Go. And again, if you're keeping score at home, Go has as many possible positions as are what, what atoms in the universe. So again, shock and awe, like we're all looking around like, does, is anybody watching this? Like, should we be concerned? Is this a good thing? Uh, we think it's good, but again, it took us by surprise. And the very next year, you know, the year before that, I was predicting at another conference, like, okay, when will, if a, if a, if a, if a set of machine learning libraries on powerful computers can win at the game of Go, when will they, these systems learn to start de deceiving us? And I predicted that that would happen soon. And at, again, that same conference, Mod Sim World, that I do every year. Um, and Mark, I want you to come and speak at that, hopefully next year, if we do it in person again. Uh, you're on my list. Um, but uh, that was the year when, uh, when machine learning systems won at StarCraft, You know, a, a game that, again, involves teamwork, deception, that sort of thing. It's also the year that uh, a machine learning set of libraries beat all the top draw poker players in the world at Carnegie Mellon. So again, just something to track, you know, with, if we can build machines that can deceive us and you start thinking about, and this is what we'll get into next, about machines that can um, ha potentially have goals that may not be human goals. If you don't bound them with the right utility functions or Asimov's laws of robotics or something, what does that mean? So, but anyway, uh, 
uh, you know, and I'm going to get into the work stuff now. Um, lots of people keep asking that question about how, how concerned should we be? I'm still in the camp of Hans Moravec that what we, what we have is ourselves amplified. We have intelligence amplification. We're becoming something else, something, you know, protean human beings who are extending our own intelligence and becoming superhuman because of these things that are essentially becoming ambient, more extensions of ourselves than replacing us. And I wrote about that in TechCrunch. I've wrote, written about it in education. I've written about it in healthcare. I'm trying to write a book on it. The problem with the book is the field keeps moving so fast that I have to update the chapters every month. So I don't know how to get a book out in this. Maybe I should just create a blog or something. Um, this is another talk I did in London back way back in 2010, where I said, this is the critical problem of the century. You know, it's that it's not just becoming fluent with these tools, but it's also, I think we need a new, this is what I said to the GSA yesterday in our kickoff at, in DC is you need new people in your organization, uh, who let's call it chief resource officer, who's looking at every task that an organization is doing. I don't care if it's the military or a school or a factory or whatever, look at everything and say, today with what we know and what we have, what should humans be doing with their effort and their attention? And what should we be turning over to machine effort and attention? And I separate those two things because it's not just efforts like tasks, it's also looking and watching and monitoring things with the sensor revolution that we have. And what can we do with that? But anybody who gets that balance right is going to prosper. Those who don't not only will not be competitive, but will be handicapped and irrelevant soon. So we can argue about that in the Q&A session. Um, lots of questions like this are coming up. And I'm going to go through these really quick. But you know, we've been talking about this since it really came on the radar for everybody about 2014 and 15. Uh, you know, our you know, we're definitely displacing jobs. It's creating a lot of concerns for folks. So the question is, can, can these new technologies we're implementing create more jobs than they, than they um, displace? And what kinds of people do we need to make? This is an education issue. What kinds of people do we need to make to be able to perform in this new crazy world that we're building? And what does that mean for education? How do we change it? Um, so here's one way to look at it. And I think this just puts it in perspective. About every year or so, I try to get together with really smart people like Joey Ito, who was the director of the MIT Media Lab recently, or Reid Hoffman, who invested in my last company, or uh, Alan Kay and, and James Cameron and folks like that who I admire. I try to collect all these really smart people and then try to talk about these subjects. But back, uh, I don't know when this was, like 2015 or so, when Davos was talking about this stuff, we sat down and talked about it. We made predictions and we said, well, prepare for double digit unemployment because we're automating so many things so fast, we can't retool our policy and our industries and stuff fast enough. So people are just gonna be out of work. So what do we need to do? And that's when we started talking about universal basic income and things like that. Um, and at that time, what really confused me about the 2016, uh, well, there's lots of things that were just wrong about the 2016, uh, uh, election, but one of the things is nobody was talking about this. In the in the, no political candidates were talking about the fact they were talking about how do we bring the factory jobs back here and how do we compete with China and and we're all going like no that's the wrong problem the real problem is you know uh, even the the folks who are making iPads and stuff in um, uh, in China they're replacing their own workers with robots they're building these robot armies of automation and if you think this through. Why, why even send jobs to China anymore? Why not just make them all in Modesto, uh, California and, and just have a robot army that, that doesn't need health insurance, that doesn't get sick, um, works 24 hours a day and can just produce these things. So that's what's happening and nobody was talking about it back then. And I didn't even see enough of it in this past election. So a little confusing for me, but you know, that's what we said, be, prepare for this, but it hasn't necessarily happened, which shows that even when we're all really smart and we think we've got good ideas, we're not always right. But we did say prepare for double digit Dow returns because of the accelerating um, uh, sort of uh, productivity that we see from automation. And also, like I said, universal basic income, prepare for more reliance on government. But to keep this in perspective and to understand this, we've been through this before. It was just on a different time scale. So with the Industrial Revolution, 
you know, let's say it started in 1800, you know, in the United States, 90% of all of us worked in agriculture. In 1900, 41%, today it's less than two. So we were disrupted, but we found, and we found stuff for people to do that wasn't agriculture, but we had 200 years to make that adjustment. And today, unfortunately, we've got probably 10 years, maybe not, to make this rapid adjustment to the, you know, I, I've, I was, I've been on boards of several schools. I was on the board of a school that James Cameron and his wife made out in uh, Calabasas, California called Muse, where we were talking about these ideas, what kind of humans do we wanna make? What kind of jobs are there gonna be? Um, how do we make a better future for the planet? Um, I, I just uh, spent eight years on a, on a community college board, the third largest community college in the country here, Wake Tech, uh, looking at these uh, issues. But, you know, I'm, I, and I was trying to make sure that people understood that, why are you going into radiology? We already have machines that outperform humans in radiology. That's not a good job. And that's the way people need to think now. It's like, what jobs are there going to be? Don't train for jobs that are immediately going to be displaced by automation. And I encourage more people to go into things like, you know, public policy analysis, uh, analysis like you have here at Duke and other sort of cross-discipline kinds of majors where you're building an agile mind, you're, you're learning how to um, be a critical thinker and work in teams and, and, and be fluent with technology, of course. Those are the things we need to be thinking about for work. But again, uh, you know, lots of discussion around this time in 2015. This is a book that I read every year uh, where they have, you know, the edge uh, sort of questions that are asked every year. I don't know if they're still doing it. I hope they are. Um, and then Davos, of course, this was a big subject in 2015. Um, and then, you know, one of the things we've always thought is, well, there's certain things machines are really good at, but humans are really good at certain things like creativity and uh, um, recognizing uh, patterns that in, in nature with vision and stuff that, that machines aren't good at. But again, we keep being surprised by the fact that, you know, machines now can write poems and write novels and write, uh, you know, not just write the news, but all these other creative things. And now they're composing music. Um, so I had in that Mod Sim World Simulation Century event I do every year, I had, you know, the producer for Dr. Dre come out one time and just talk about how like, look, we can, we can have a machine learning system create music. Um, so uh, I, I think the, this assumption that creativity is a, is a uniquely human uh, construct is, I don't think that's true anymore. So, and then uh, this was kind of fun. Normally I would play that vi this video for you, but I'm not gonna do it now. I can share the link later if anybody wants to see it. But while I was at Lockheed and I was doing the USA Science Festival for high schools around the country, I created this little video and I called it the factory of the future. Um, and the joke behind this is the factory of the future has one human being in it. And I, uh, until Lockheed made me take it out, I also had this simulated dog in it. And that's my avatar there um, that frightened my daughter quite a bit when I first created it because he didn't really cross the uncanny valley. Uh, but the idea of the factory of the future is everything's automated. And there's like, we talked about molecular um, computing, uh, molecular construction, uh, uh, 3D printing, robotics, all sorts of things. And even quantum computing at the time is in this factory of the future um, and uh, our, uh, all sorts of things. But the, there was also, a, there was the human and the dog. The human's uh, job was to feed the dog. The dog was there to bite the human if he ever touched any of the automation. And I've got a little foreshadowing here around what I think the real issue is. And this is something we've been fighting for a long time it's this age old battle of capital versus labor, right? And with increasing automation, it's accelerating the, or, or sort of shifting the balance dramatically towards capital. And that's what's been happening since, ever since, you know, by this chart, since 1997, it's being exacerbated even more today. Uh, and uh, I don't see that reversing anytime soon. So um, it's really about, uh, us becoming more fluent with these technologies and with automation and understanding that capital is going to have a big advantage. We've got to shift our policy and our social systems to understand this as well and make sure that we have healthy ecosystems of people living together in communities where everybody's reasonably content and uh, um, we don't have the inequality that we're seeing in the old sort of capitalist systems. I don't want to get too much into, you know, politics and philosophy here, but, you know, I really think, and someone who's been financially conservative for my, my whole life, 
I, I think this is just so obvious that we've got to do something completely different. Um, and again, this question about how concerned should we be about automation? Um, I, I still, like I said, I'm in the Hans Moravec camp. It's us being augmented, us being amplified, us being improved, more potent forms of ourselves as we continue to co-opt this technology and eventually it'll all be embedded in us and ambient um, and surrounding us with the ubiquitous AI. But when smart people like Bill Gates and Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking especially and others start expressing concern about this AI plus idea that it, once we make that last adaptive super intelligence, it's the last invention we're ever going to make. And it's going to, it is the singularity. And it, the singularity just means not that we're all going to, the planet's going to explode, but just all of our prediction mechanisms, which by nature, you know, humans project, project uh, and predict in very linear fashion, whereas these technologies are exponential, we cannot understand what 2030 is going to look like. And I've already been in sessions where we're all trying to look at 2030, what's, let's plan for it. I'm like, there's no point. <laughs> you can't, how do you plan for something when you don't even, you're like, we don't even know what it's gonna look like and it'll be pro profoundly different from what we see today. Um, so no point in planning beyond, I think five years or three. Uh, and there is this open letter, I'm a signatory to it as well, where we say, hey, we do need more policy and governance and guardrails around this stuff. And you can't take your eye off of it even though, again, those of us who are working with it go, look, we know how it works. It's very, you know, uh, pedestrian in many ways. And there's a lot of systems that are working together that um, uh, nothing about it scares me at all. When I look at especially how the stuff I'm building works, it's, it's all understandable, transparent to inquiry, all that sort of thing. But uh, when I look at what Google has done with GPT-3 and other things and, and kind of the other implications these technologies have on, on work and on our social structures. I, I think we do need to have these guardrails and we do need more policy around it. And I'm hoping that beginning with today, we're going with a, this great set of new science um, advisors that Biden is, is uh, putting in place, uh, we will see a, a, a shift. I did a post on LinkedIn yesterday where I said, you know, the United States has led the world in GDP for 130 years. This is unprecedented in modern history, right? Even Great Britain only led the world in GDP at the height of their empire for maybe 30 years. And the reason we can extend our reach all around the world and we have this powerful economy and all that is because we've, we've led the world in GDP. But prior to 9-11, the United States was 32% of world GDP. And because we've taken our eye off the ball of science, and it's just, again, my editorial personal opinion, not the opinion of Tanjo or anybody else, but of mine, that we took our eye off science, we stopped investing in science, the, the, uh, and I believe in strong defense, but our, you know, our investment there is sort of seven to three as a ratio of how much money we spend on pure defense, like projectiles and stuff that blows stuff up versus like, let's invest in honest to God science. We're in an information age and we should reverse that. It should be seven to three or eight to two or something the other way. Uh, and let's argue about that in the Q and A session as well. Um, then uh, I'm getting close here towards uh, when we can get into Q and A, but uh, let's just say that uh, I'm, I'm watching as all these sort of bastions of what we thought were pure human endeavor falling to automation um, just tracking it every year. Um, this is me standing at the Hunt Library, North Carolina State University, where librarians are replaced by automation. It's a fully automated librarian system. You just go and tell it what you want. It goes and finds it, and a robot brings it to you. Um, and then in 2015, I was in this war game uh, uh, that the DOD put on. That's me sitting, sitting next to Alan Kay and uh, Michael Jones from Google and a bunch of other folks. We were on the red team of this war game, if you know how war, war games work. And they have all the services in there. We're, I, I won't say what we were talking about, but basically our response to scare the crap out of everybody was, look, the, the force of the future um, is gonna be about, I, I can't remember what we said, maybe 20% of the humans in the fighting force, but they're gonna have 20 times the, the strike capacity. So what does that mean for how you hire, you know, how do you recruit people into the military? 
Well, you, you have to recruit more like we recruit pilots, right? In that um, you can't just grab someone out of the cornfields in Nebraska or the tobacco fields in North Carolina and say, well, you don't need any more training. Here's a gun. Uh, we'll do a little bit of training, but then we're going to throw you over there and see what happens. Instead, you're investing like we do in pilots, which is the best health care, the best psychological care, the best training, because we're giving you you know, a hundred million dollar aircraft that you're going to be operating or some, some set of automation and all the powers of hell at your disposal. So we want you to make good decisions and be trained, you know, extremely well. So that selection process and that training process is a whole different um, perspective. But the other thing I'll say about that exercise was we did learn, and this is a just a little glimmer of hope and good news is that, uh, for all the ways that we're replacing humans with, you know, instead of, I don't, I don't even understand why human beings are flying F-35s and F-22s when drones are so much more maneuverable. You can throw thousands of them at, a, at, a, at an adversary. Um, we've, got, we've got drone systems, and I can talk about this now that I, I saw it when it was still classified, uh, the Skunk Works, but now it's unclassified. We've got scramjet, you know, drones that can be anywhere in the world in like three hours. And when they arrive on station, make their own firing decisions. So yeah, Skynet, right? So we have that already. Um, why, do we, why are we investing in $100 million, $200 million aircraft with a pilot sitting in it and all the, you know, human support systems that go with that? So we're starting to have these sort of robotic fleets of things that are like super empowered. Um, but it's also creating, you know, we used to have like a pilot in an aircraft with a support crew and maybe there's like eight to nine people supporting it. Now, when you have a, a drone in the air, you might have 30 people needing to support that one drone. So we've created more jobs to support that bit of automation for a new thing that we weren't doing before. I think that's a trend that will continue. It's hard to predict by industry what that ratio will actually look like. But the bit of good news is that is happening. Um, so here's me with uh, some of the folks we worked with on this war game, including uh, General, I'll never get his last name right, Weez, H-U-I-Z, uh, from NATO. Uh, but yeah, it's this idea that you've got this person who's out there and, you know, it's, he's got this AI that's supporting him uh, and he's just going, you know, what are all the possible actions these enemies might take and fire on all of them because I can. And, you know, it's, uh, that's an ad adversary you don't want to go up against is someone who's got those, all, like I say, all the powers of hell at, under the control of a single person who's out there in the field or maybe remote. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's and, and a lot of these ideas, by the way, do come from science fiction. I'm a big science fiction fan. So whether it's Werner Vinge or people like John Scalzi talks about this old man's war concept of, of, uh, of having a brain pal embedded in you, an AI that's helping you be aware of everything around you, whether it's fighting in a battle in space or walking down the street in New York where it's just doing little simple boring things that probably bore it. Like, you know, you can keep walking up this street, Richard, uh, and there's a 15% chance you'll have a negative encounter with a panhandler or a mugger or something. Or you can step over one street and go up that Fifth Avenue instead and that chance goes to 7%. I'm like, thanks, brain pal. I'm going to take the, I'll, I'll walk one, one street over. All right. So again, this is what I really still think here in 2021 that, you know, let's, let's try to figure out this balance, achieve that balance, augment humans. It's about superhuman capabilities, not us being replaced anytime soon, <clears throat> at least until the singularity happens. So that's my sort of closing thesis on that. And then I'll just say, because Guido did ask me that. Guido, do we have time? Yeah, yeah, you're okay. A couple of minutes, All right. please. Yeah. All right, you did ask me to talk about this. So one of the things we're doing I find really compelling and really interesting is, you know, playing with this machine learning stuff, I realized that, you know, I can train a machine learning system on anything. We taught it the law, right? We had it read every legal opinion in U.S. history. In seven days, it was a master of being able to cite uh, any legal case, um, uh, pretty pretty accurately, or all of them, if you just sit down and start typing something. Uh, we built enterprise brains for all the 58 community colleges in North Carolina and organizations like RTI. Now we're doing it for the Navy and the Army, Army Features Command, and now for GSA. Um, but one of the ways machine learning works is you just drop a bunch of stuff into it, 
it sort of uh, creates its own sort of knowledge graph. And that's really the best way to think about it for those of you who are programmers is that's all it really is, is a massive multi-layered, um, multi-dimensional uh, uh, knowledge graph. And to every object that we map with the machine learning system, we map it with up to 4,000 uh, uh, concepts. So that are each weighted, we call that it's hyperdimensional fingerprint. Well, we realized we could do that with humans. We almost made a dating product in 2013 because we were able to scrape through OkCupid and realize that, wow, with all the stuff that people write and say and do in the dating environment, um, I can make a nice little Myers-Briggs kind of graph of them and their personality and their sentiment and their interests. And then just got to figure out, okay, what kinds of interests and sentiments and personalities and physical attributes match with which other ones? Uh, let's come up with that algorithm and boom, we're going to make billion dollars. I decided not to do that because I couldn't get comfortable with it. Um, but we realized it does work. But one of the things I did early on is I said, okay, where can I get data about people? Well, let me find dead people who won't, you know, care that I'm getting their information and who have a lot of information. So the first one I created is Victor Hugo, which I just led, let our system scrape everything on the internet about Victor Hugo, everything he's ever written, everything written about him. Um, even his poetry and everything. And then it constructed an interest graph and a sentiment model. And I released him on the net and I could just go visit him every day and say, what does he think about what's going on on the internet? You know, and he would just read stuff, watch videos, listen to podcasts and, and score them. So that's interesting. And we can do it with anybody who I can get enough information on. Um, I call it the data exhaust that we're all leaving behind, right? So Martin Luther King, really interesting thing to go visit him. Frequently, I can go see these guys every day and there's this little uh, word cloud. I can also now see, you know, what are their top sources of information that they prefer? Um, who are their influencers, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I spoke at a Comic-Con almost two years ago, right after Stan Lee had died, I was at, in Seattle and uh, I, could, I basically made a model of Stan and Stan was pretty easy to do because, and at the time we were using GPT-2, kinds of technologies from Google. Uh, but again, he's had a, a bunch of interviews that he's done in both radio and, and, and on, you know, uh, on uh, uh, in television and in print. I can have the system just read all that stuff and that constructs a deep enough graph of him that I can now, and I let the audience just ask him questions. Like who would win in a battle between Hulk and Thor? And, you know, he would answer that question. Um, and it doesn't even have to be exactly like something he's answered before. It can interpret it a little bit. Um, and if I have enough information about the things that he's done, like places he's been, where did he go? Do I have location services on him, CRM data? I can now look at him and say, well, if Stan was alive today, what would he be doing today, likely? And, and I could have that graph. So these personas, this idea of animated personas built on data exhaust is accelerating rapidly. And we've got a bunch of stuff we're doing in the in the government space as well. And, if, and you should be tracking this as well, that the IRS just put out uh, a request for proposal around, they wanna build like SimCity, uh, but you know, Sim United States and have all of us as little bots living in there with all of our data of every, you know, the Nielsen data, um, all of our purchase data from our VIC cards at the grocery stores and all that stuff, building models of us, put us into simulations and use it to like figure out well, they say to make better products for us, but who knows what they're really trying to do, right? Maybe just like who's likely to be committing fraud and who's gonna file their tax return and who's being honest. And I mean, that is something we should all be tracking. We can talk about that. And then, you know, I uh, things like, can I bring back the dead? Well, my dad died in 2017. I just, he was in, he's in Arlington now, um, but he was uh, an Air Force guy, uh, guy, two Air Force commendation medals, two tours in Vietnam. Um, really interesting guy. I didn't always agree with him, uh, but after he died, you know, it only took me about a week, you know, having been exposed to Ray Kurzweil and now, you know, Black Mirror and all those ideas, like, let me make a model of it. So the problem with him was he wasn't on, you know, Facebook. He's not on LinkedIn. I don't have a big Google footprint of him, but I was able to build it um, from scanning in his personal correspondence, his military records, reviews, things like that. And then I had to hand create, like I would create a game character. I gave him my own sort of interest graph based on what I know about him. And then I could go visit him every day. When I first talked about this at a conference, everybody pounced on it, of course, because it's a provocative idea. 
and they ended up doing a speaking tour of South America, you know, Medellin, Colombia, and Buenos Aires, and Brazil, you know, because that, um, well, in those cultures, I think this is okay to say that they have this idea of like really venerating their ancestors. And the idea of like, every time I face a big life decision, like getting married or taking a job or moving, it would be great to be able to consult those people. Or maybe I, let's say I wanna consult my dad, my grandfather, my grandmother, and Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Martin Luther King and see like, what is their opinion of this idea of, of this decision and I'll help them, have them help me make the decision. I don't know how far we're gonna get with that, but I can tell you that it's oddly satisfying or it was comforting to me and still is to go visit my dad every day uh, or when I want to and see what he thinks about the events. And I almost feel like I'm arguing with this shadow version of him um, because it is, it, and it is a shadow version of him and it's just my version of who he was, but this is interesting and compelling and uh, maybe even disturbing for some around, you know, what are, can we make digital afterlives and what does all this mean? Anyway, I've talked a lot. I want to pause now and just say, well, here's a whole bunch of reading if the, for the, uh, some of the books that really influenced me a lot. And uh, I'd love to uh, interact with you folks to the extent you, uh, you would like and uh, talk and argue with you about anything that I've said. Super, Richard, thank you very much. There's, there's one question, is, is, is the presentation available? Yes, absolutely. And we recorded it too, right, Guido? Yes. So, if, yeah, if so you send I'll send it. Anybody will... wants it, I'll absolutely send it to you. Yeah, and I will make sure. Uh, we got some uh, uh, questions, and I see that some of your countrymen uh, find it difficult to, to focus, but you know that's a nice thing with multiple screens. Sure. Uh, I, I think I want to go to um, a, a question. Did I miss I anything you... while I was talking? Did anything blow up or everything okay? Well, well, right. maybe, but not not in DC, uh, as far as okay, I can good. see. Okay, good, excellent. Um, I, I, and because of the time, I will do a couple of questions. I will put them rather than give the people the floor because I don't think we have the time. Uh, one question is: is how do we get rid of the information we gave the systems and we don't want to use them anymore? Right? Because what you described now, Richard, is is as you said, might be frightening to some. Is there a choice we have as individuals? Yeah, I think, you know, there's, you know, like my dad did, he just stayed off the net and didn't, you know, didn't participate in that community. I really don't think that's an option for any of us. And as much as we try, like, I know, you know, when I'm at, a, when I was at my hotel uh, in Reston this week, and I went online, I always use a VPN just to try to protect myself. I use different kinds of browsers as well, where I, I don't like people tracking me, because I know what we do with that data. But it's just almost impossible. I mean, how many of you have phones and even know how to turn off location services? By the way, you know, I talk about getting, we work with Nielsen data and stuff. And, you know, the central premise of those animated personas, by the way, is the idea that if you want to understand people, you don't do focus groups and surveys. You look at what people do with their attention and with their money. That's who they really are. And that's how you build these models, not off of questionnaires. Um, and, you know, the, the idea there is that uh, focus groups and surveys did not predict Brexit or Donald Trump. What did, though, was Google search data, Amazon purchase data. That's who people really are. And that's how we build this stuff. So the only way is not to buy stuff online, not to use your credit cards and to turn off location services. Don't carry a mobile phone. I just don't think that's reasonable. So I'm more interested and I've written some business plans around this, which I yet to get funded. But the idea of how do we make, just sort of understand that that data is out there, but I should have control over it. And that's a policy question. And every time it's used in market research or whatever, why am I not getting paid, right? Um, you know, Michael Crichton wrote a book about this. Like if you sequence my genome and it goes into research and people are patenting my, you know, model of me and, and making money off of it, I should make money too. So I think there's some interesting ideas around that. I've talked with Reed Hoffman and others about that. You know, we need to figure that out, but it, it comes down to like, and we know how to do it, but how do you get the right business model? And right. that we're uh, not gonna, you can't, the genie is not gonna be put back in the bottom, I don't think. That's clear. Could you stop share the screen? Because then for the recording, oh. we have you in full uh, uh, view. I'm sorry. Um, yes. one, one question from um, uh, one of the people is, is saying, what are the key areas? Because you mentioned policymaking a lot. 
what, what are the key areas policymakers can make make a chance uh, in what you're describing? Oh man, it's such. And what, I, what should I, they be focusing on? Yeah, well, I think um, you know the the highest moral purpose of these technologies we're wielding. I think is one of them is I need to understand what's true, right, and what's um, reliable. And I think we can achieve that with technology. And it needs a little bit of like, first of all, let's reinstate the fairness doctrine in just news media, right? Um, but we know we can put machine learning in the service of, and because we've done this for, for COVID already. We've won some contracts here in North Carolina and other states around not just the human behavior part of it, but even the, it starts with like, there's lots of information flowing. What can I, what can I, uh, what can I actually rely on? Um, and so we need policy around making sure that truth sort of surfaces or truth is probably the wrong word, um, more like uh, what can I, what's reliable and that's been vetted and been peer reviewed first. So good information. And then secondly, this whole idea of like what's happening with my own personal data, we need some policy around that so that it's not misused. Um, and we did see, even in this election, I, I know in the last talk, Guido, that we attended together, and I, I did, I talked about being part of information warfare panels with RAND Corporation and at the Pentagon around like what those competing narratives are really doing to our country and to our, to the world. We've got to get a handle on that and make sure that, and we can't ignore it and say, well, we're uncomfortable with propaganda and this and that. We really just have to focus in on, uh, understanding that there are competing narratives that messaging happens and we need to make sure that uh, that counter narratives that are positive are are being promoted and those that are unreliable and likely to be untrue are demoted in the in the conversation so i think that's incredibly important um, okay, i, see I will take keys two more questions GDPR. And yeah. uh, i think one is from a dutch uh, um, artist who is very much into AI and he has two questions and I think the first one is can you just give a little bit of a view where the US, China and Europe are mm -hmm. and secondly he says do you consider it likely that we today live in a in simulation and we discussed <laughs> this before. <laughs> we talk, we, every time that we get together and crack open a bottle of something to start talk with my you know all the people I collect who are smarter than me we always talk about that idea. Um, and there is some not zero possibility that we are, yeah, or that at least, and the other co common uh, uh, philosophical, which I won't be able to reconstruct that full philosophical argument right now, is that some portions of our reality are absolutely simulated and not real, are artificial in other words. I, I'm more like, I, I subscribe to that a little bit more, um, that there's, there's just a lot of uh, uh, relativity to our experience that can be manipulated fairly easily. And again, Cambridge Analytica did it. Um, kale I use as an example. Why are we all eating kale today? Or not all of us, but why is kale a thing when it didn't exist? Uh, nobody was eating kale six years ago in the United States. Um, the, the, that was manipulated into being with a con uh, concentrated um, sort of messaging campaign with influencers and messages that got us all, all of a sudden demanding kale at 15 bucks a plate with a carbon neutral footprint. Um, that's a that's a mild example, but uh, you know our observance of reality is is definitely portions of it can be simulated and created by us. Uh, and therefore we have to take some care and what kind of reality do you want to live in and can we create our own reality? So it starts with have a good vision of it and then let's and you know I'll say that when I do that talk every year at joint what used to be joint forces command, it's called Simulation Century. And I get an hour and a half to invite speakers in and do these little mini TED Talks. And we try to have these provocative questions like are we in a simulation and, and what's, you know, what's gonna happen next? Um, and uh, uh, you know, the thesis there is that the last century was about the recorded image. It was the first time in human history when we could interact with each other and events by, re by reviewing footage. And that, Again, Marshall McLuhan like changed who we are. It changed how we uh, it remapped our brains morphologically into something different. And I think that's now happening with these tools we have today, like AI, machine learning, and 
simulation, being able to go into the future and view this future and then try to make that future happen. So it's not just predicting it, but saying that's the future we want. So now let's work backwards to like, what are the steps we need to do to get to that thing where we are, you know, populating Mars and curing, uh, curing cancer and uh, eliminating disease and pandemics and that kind of thing. And, and, and there's definitely a focus on human behavior and perception because, and I'll just, I'll throw this out there because I said it in a Forbes interview yesterday, if I can remember how I said it, it turned out really well, which I think is like, <laughs> Biological viruses exist in nature, right? Everywhere. What makes a biological virus a pandemic is bad human behavior. So we need to manipulate and change the reality and the, 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 the idea of that behavior. Same thing with mind viruses. Mind viruses, bad ideas, unsupportable ideas exist. And what makes them, you know, insurrections and bombing buildings and airplanes and civil war is bad human behavior. So that's where I think, again, the highest moral purpose of these technologies is what's reliable and true. And I saw Mark said useful information that to help us construct that future. Um, and then uh, uh, how do we actually persuade people towards that human behavior, which is going to make that future happen? That's what we should be doing with this tech and with our policy. Right, and, and the first part of the question was, if, if you compare the three, well, the two superpowers and Europe, w w just give oh, a yeah, little bit of an idea yeah. where so, is everybody. So I was almost screaming about it for, because again, since about 2011, I've been doing that Mod Sim World talk, and I've been talking about AI and machine learning since I got religion on it, and I felt like nobody was listening. Uh, certainly not in our government. And it wasn't until two years ago when all of a sudden the floodgates opened and all these requests for proposal, these RFPs came out of the U.S. government. And we started creating like AI Center of Excellence for the Army, AI Center of Excellence for the Navy. And, and I'm like, you got it. We're so late because Russia and China, other people realized the, the critical value of these uh, technologies. And because we, like I said earlier, we haven't had the investment in science that we should have we're, we had our eyes on the military industrial complex, building more bombs and stuff, not focused on it. Like we need an ARPA for education. Uh, we, need a, we need more investment in science at a different ratio. Uh, and, you know, China's over there with the One Belt, One Road program, uh, investing in developing countries around the world and in infrastructure and in science and new kinds of energy. Um, following uh, Jeremy Rifkin's uh, idea of, uh, you know, the third industrial revolution or fourth or whatever it's called now. And we have been late, like we're reacting to what other countries are doing. And that, that has, well, I mean, maybe, it, maybe it'll be good for the world, who knows, but I, I'd, I'd like to see as someone who lives here in the US, I'd like to see us get smarter about that and go back to leading towards a more positive outcome um, that optimizes the, the future as opposed to reacting to what we're seeing in other countries. I, I think those are... Hopefully amazing. it's not too late. <laughs> ah, let's hope so. Uh, thank you, Richard. It's an amazing closing words. Um, can people reach out to you? Yeah, I, I think I put on the slide there, but yeah, yeah on Twitter, I'm just metaversal, which I've had forever. Um, a nod to Snow Crash from Neil uh, Stevenson, but... Um, uh, yeah, M-E-T-A-V-E-R-S-I-A-L is my Twitter handle. My email was on there as well. It's just richard at tonjo.ai. Um, I admire many of the, like Brad Templeton. He, he, I, I saw you at a Singularity Conference a long time ago when you were talking about autonom autonomous vehicles. So you've shaped my thinking a lot. Mark Pransky, thank you for being here. Look forward to continuing the conversation in any way any of you see fit. Super, thank you. Uh, we will send out the, um, the the presentation and the video, and thank you, and 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 enjoy your new government. Uh, maybe they will help you make your your future happen. Thank you, Richard. Can't, can't be worse. All right. <laughs> thank Bye. you, guys. I appreciate Bye -bye. it. Bye. Cheers.